Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Art as Well. Um, a couple of things before we introduce our guest this morning. Um, a, we, I wanted to mention a few exhibitions that are taking place at the present uh, amongst former interviewees. And I stress that because I probably didn't say it in the beginning, and I, I would be inundated with people saying, oh, I have an exhibition starting here and there. It's really um, for, for those who have been featured on The Art as Well. Um, so at the moment we have Claire Halpin, uh, who I didn't mention the last last week because I wasn't uh, sure of it, but she is um, uh, hosting a uh, an exhibition called Deck at the Lab Gallery uh, in Foley Street, Dublin. Um, Tim Goulding uh, launched his exhibition in the Lab Gallery last Thursday, so that's continuing uh, till April. Um, Cecilia Donnell is at the Lewin Gallery in Athlone, and also she's the winner of the prestigious 1922 Hennessy uh, Craig Award. So congratulations to her for winning that, that's super. And finally, Eamon Coleman continues at the Solomon Gallery. All right. Um, now, uh, our guest this morning is a specialist in trademarks in intellectual property and copyright. And she's a partner in the law firm Gleason McGrath Baldwin, uh, which is based in Anglesey Street. And I know this firm for a long time and uh, I've dealt with them, but Eileen, I haven't. Uh, but she, she is a specialist in this area. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity if she could talk to us uh, about all of that sort of area uh, as it pertains to artists. And I don't mean just visual artists, you know, I mean, composers, um, musicians, poets, everything, all right, across the whole gambit. Now, a number of you have sent in questions and we'll probably go through that. But first, let me go to Eileen and say good morning. Hello, Eileen. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, How are you? everybody. So you're very welcome. Where are you? Are you in Dublin? I am. I'm in the city. I'm in Dublin East in the Tenters. Very good. Very years good. old this year. Yeah. Our okay. neighbourhood. Yeah. So it's great. Um, it's a, a very, I'd say, a vibrant artistic neighbourhood. Oh, um, right. Yes. yes. A lot of artists, a lot of musicians. Uh, most gable ends have been, you know, designed by street artists. And yeah. Yeah. It's great, it's a great place to live, but also close to everything as well. Yes. So, yeah, so it's great to be part of it, actually, because, yeah, I've always had a love for all of the art and mm. culture. Um, and I suppose before I qualified as a solicitor, I, I thought I might be, my teens, I thought I might be an artist um, and got my place in Limerick and then had a change of mind and decided I'd study Italian. Um, and then had another change of mind and thought I might become a journalist yeah. and ran a radio station in Dublin for a few years. Did you? And then did an absolute about turn and said, no, I'm sure I'll become a lawyer. So I suppose with that kind of background, I was never going to be just buying and selling houses. Um, I, always, I always wanted to do something that kind of culturally intersected um, and also look at the whole sector. And I had a lot of friends who were musicians um, and really had been burnt in the 80s through contracts where they never got independent advice. And, you know, there was a whole thing that their music would be owned regardless of whether it was released by labels and all of that. So I suppose that really piqued my interest and it brought me to Gleason McGrath Baldwin as well, who had a great legacy in the arts in Ireland. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that's just a little bit of background. Yeah, no, very good, very good. Mm. So, um, I mean, what, what sort of people do you deal with now without divulging too many details? You know, what sort no, of well, uh, yeah, obviously yeah. We're, we're all about client confidentiality until mm. it makes the paper or you're seen walking out of the forecourts. And then you, they lose copyright, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, then you have the whole, yeah, the whole question about the photograph. But um, yeah. so, I mean, my core practice would be a corporate practice so I would deal with a lot of businesses and companies and um, and then intellectual property a lot of musicians I would say more so than visual artists absolutely we have visual artists in and um, from time to time on you know basic copyright infringement itself and um, I've dealt with some composers specifically for film scores and um, and, you know, you, you get the weird and the wonderful. Um, I have a trademark qualification in Ireland and in Europe. So I also do some trademark work and passing off and filings, you know, for people who are protecting their brands. Um, and then, you know, it's the business end as well. I deal a lot with artists. And again, it's performing artists a lot more who go on tour, 
um, who set up companies, who, if you have a band and they want to share out rights, you know, how do they set up their structures? Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of people, it's their livelihood. Mm-hmm. So while it's a fantastic livelihood to have, um, you know, they still need to look at the business aspects if they want to make a living out of it. Um, of and I suppose I can bring that element in mm-hmm. um, into people knowing how the business operates as well. Very good. Um, but I mean, I, you know, recently we have had music copyright infringement in the office. We've had a designer whose designs were used um, for a public product. And it, an interesting one, actually, it's, it didn't go to court, thankfully. We really try and settle as much as we can. But a, a, a young designer was approached by an ad agency and asked if she would sell some of her designs for a product they were designing for a client. Um, and she asked for what I felt was a very reasonable sum. And they said, no, not budgeted for, sorry, we can't do it. And then the product came out with a design that looked very uncannily like hers. Mm-hmm. And again, she was a young artist. She wouldn't have had, you know, maybe she'd be worried about costs and legal fees and and she was introduced to me by somebody and I wrote to the agency and their solicitor got in touch and you know they held up their hands and they said yeah it does look very alike and I said well the fact that you asked first yes and you got it you couldn't pay a proper sum you know Mm -hmm. you have to respect these people's Work, people's work so anyway that one was settled so you things like that where mm-hmm. people are slow to come forward and 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 say i think they copied my work yeah because and, they don't have the resources they don't and they don't know where it's going to go or where it's yeah. going to end up and i mean mm-hmm. that was one where it was it was pretty black and they're seldom black and white but that one was very mm-hmm. clear mm-hmm. so really there wasn't a huge amount of legal time once the first letter came across there was a couple of phone calls and that was the end of it yeah you know, and she got properly compensated, which is the right way to do it. Uh, absolutely. And I, I, I think that's wonderful. And hopefully the agencies will, you know, learn a lesson that, it, you know, if they paid the original license fee, it was would have been a lot cheaper at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's creating respect and, and properly re- remunerating artists mm. is something that you really need to bring home all the time to people. Yeah. But but your point about, you know, people being reluctant to bring these things up, uh, which which by and large would be based on, on, on financial considerations. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to what extent can you can you, you know, look at a case and say this is clear cut, we'll take it on? Yeah, I mean, as or I could said, that could that particular artist have, have faced a potential cost had she been unsuccessful? Yeah, well, they could. So so obviously, mm-hmm. you know, we would look at something and judge it on its merits and say, there is merit and um, you know there is going to be a cost you can run through the costs with somebody and um, you know the costs if you can settle something early and if it is clean cut you have a better likelihood of settling it early of yeah. could be minimal but then if somebody wants to go to court that's where the costs run up and obviously if they're successful they can recover you know a large portion not all but a large portion of their costs and mm-hmm. um, but if they're unsuccessful they can be hit with the other side's costs yeah, and so, I suppose that there are there are other elements as well, Eileen, such yeah. as the reputation of the agency. Uh, they they mm-hmm. don't want to have their name besmirched in public uh, and and, and mm. being seen to be, you know. No, and, and the other thing was because I have a trademark infringement at the moment where it's again, um, it's somebody doing a job for somebody else, and so you're you're you've a, you, I suppose your stick there is if you don't deal with this directly and quickly and appropriately, well, then we'd have to let your client know that they have infringing material on their product. Yes. And really, that's that's the wake up call, you know? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Mm. All right. Let, let, let's go to some of the questions. Um, in fact, I'm not going to take them in, in the correct order because uh, the other one, the, the first two are to do with NFTs. And, and I'd rather leave that to a little bit later. Um, but I want to go to one from Paul McCormack. And uh, he says, Dear Alan, thanks for raising the issue. My concern is about the use of other people's images as the source and basis of my art. I, and he uses inverted commas, appropriate to use art speak, images as part of my concepts. In America, I understand that this can be done legitimately to repurpose them creatively. And much of pop art and postmodernism is about this. I believe the copyright laws in Ireland are strict and do not allow this. Basing my work on actual advert on an actual advert is important to the validity 
of my social commentary and I ask uh, if I'm leaving myself open to litigation. Similarly, I use collage and I wonder do the, the original publishers have any claim over the finished collage? I'm keen to hear the answers. So Paul, Paul has done sort of various works like it's far from Boulabas we've been raised, you know, and he has these incredible things. He'd have a fish and he might have pastis, I think maybe is the an ingredient, but that's a brand, you know, owned by Ricard and a multinational giant corporation. And is he opening himself up to risk by, by using that and not altering it? I mean, Paul, Paul, tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it, it's exactly the same brand. You know, it's not changed in any way. Is that a bit dicey? Yeah, so it, it, this is an interesting one because when we spoke initially, Alan, I, I just thought artists, I thought copyright, you know, people copying their works, you know, very straightforward. And then I looked at this question when it came in and I thought, OK, we're not just dealing with copyright. So intellectual property is a whole bundle of rights. It's copyright law, it's trademark law, it's design, it's databases, it's patents, which is serious inventive stuff. Um, so, so this one, I suppose, you'd be looking at trademarks um, and a trademark is, I, I'll go back a little bit, mm. for copyright, you do not need any form of procedures to claim copyright. So as long as your work is original, in the European Union, copyright subsists in that work without you having to register it or do anything else. Now, it's different in different territories, specifically the USA, but here under the Berne Convention that you've probably all heard about, there's no requirement to register copyright, you have it once your work is original, which is important. Mm. And the second thing is then on trademarks. So trademarks are rights and they're like monopoly rights. So you have to actually register them and you can register anything as a trademark. You can register the name, uh, you can register your logo, your brand, you can register sound, you can register smell. Can you? Um, yeah, it's fascinating what you can register. You now have 3D trademarks. So what what he's using is somebody's trademark, right? And mm -hmm. and from looking at it, I think you're using like an, an old style trademark, like you know, the, the old sun soap ones back from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Yes. And so when Pernod Ricard would have registered their trademark, you don't just register your mark or your design you have to register it for the specific classes of goods and services where you're going to use it. Ah, so, okay. So you would register your mark for, let's say, alcoholic beverages. Yeah. Now, some big brands will obviously go beyond that and they will register for the merchandise element as well, or some of them might, like Harley-Davidson, it's not just for motorbikes, but it's for events and things like that. Mm. Um, and But they can only sue you for infringement if it's for if the mark is the same or similar, and it's for similar goods and services. So actually incidentally including that mark in an artwork may not be a cut and dry case depending on how far their trademark registration stretches. Very interesting. Yeah. Also their trademark registration is territorial. So let's say you register or somebody here wants to register, they use an artist's name or they've come up with some great concept and they want to register it as a brand. Which, which denotes the source of your goods and services. Um, if you register it in Ireland and somebody is using it in, um, I was going to say China, but that's probably not a good example because it's the worst territory for trademark infringement. Um, yes. In Australia, if you're not registered in Australia, well, then you can't have a straightforward trademark um, infringement suit. Mm. So it, it's if you were using somebody's trademark, then you'd have to take all of the facts of the case. You'd have yeah. to look at the trademark. You'd have to look at whether, you know, it was still registered mm -hmm. uh, because a registration will last for 10 years. You can renew your registrations by paying a fee every 10 years, but some people might register and then they might update their brand and they might let some of the old registrations lapse. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's no longer registered, then, you know, you don't have straightforward in infringement. Yeah. What class of goods and services are you using it? How are you using it? So that's the clear trademark end. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, this case is great. This kind of thing you give students in Blackhall Place, you know, because it also brings in what we call passing off. So passing off is where somebody has, uh, I suppose, goodwill in what they do. They're known, they run a business. And you are using that goodwill in such a way to, to kind of trade on their coattails and 
you know, so are you using somebody else's brand to promote your own business, right? Mm -hmm. Which again would cause confusion and think that maybe you have some association with them. And I think in this case, you're not using it really to no. promote the business. It's an incidental part yeah. of the piece. And, and it's only part of the painting as well. You yeah. Know, it's an element. And incidental inclusion is is another area. So if you if something is you know not the center but just part of the background and part of the story but not totally central to it, mm. um, well then it could be deemed an in, in or an incidental mm. inclusion. And then will somebody actually would they sue you or would they feel that perhaps maybe you are doing some good to their brand? I, I was thinking that Eileen. No? I was thinking that yeah. So like there's it's a great question because there's yeah. a lot of different facets to it and it is the kind of thing you could you know dissect and look and and then and and of course if you use somebody else's trademark you know there is they could be one of these people who are like no you don't use it at all but if you're using it in a way which they're happy with they may not sue and um, if you were using it in a way maybe that was derogatory yeah. or would potentially damage their brand then you have a different story again. Totally different. So it really, yeah. really does depend on the context. Yeah, it does. It absolutely depends on the context. Yeah. It depends on the mark. It depends on everything. Um, and yeah. but but you know there is a whole area of tarnishment of trademarks. Yes. So if you do use somebody else's mark and in in a way that would potentially tarnish it, um, would have a negative impact on the goodwill that sits behind that mark. Uh, well, then you could definitely, you know, mm. be open to a suit. But then, are you using it for the goods and services they have registered it yes. for? Yes. Are you? Could you be deemed to be passing off? So there's all these different questions. That's why you need a good lawyer like you. That's why you need a good lawyer. But also, you know, the, uh, the trademark area is is great. And um, but you know, if you use somebody else's original work, whether it's protected by copyright or whether it's protected by trademark or design you always run a risk mm. that somebody will not like it. And there is a very fine line, I suppose, as well, be between kind of inspiration and paying homage to somebody. Yes. And copying. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah. So I think Paul would probably be very happy with that answer because, you know, it's, it sounds to me from what you're saying that, um, that uh, you know, he, he wouldn't really get stuck with that. But say for argument's sake, Perno Ricard decided to have a go um, would that be a cease or desist, or, or could, could they literally just sue him? Yeah. So, so you would. Be I mean, in other words, could he? Could he? Sorry for interrupting you, Eileen. Yeah. Could he say, "Oh, okay, I'll destroy my painting. I'm sorry about that." Yeah. Uh, do you know what? <laughs> there have been cases. Yes. One of one of the main things is destruction, right? So, if if somebody, if you have um, you use something that's infringing somebody else's rights they will first of all ask you to stop using it. And then they will ask you to either, you know, hand over or destroy everything for which it was being used. Um, and like we had a case before where somebody had printed jerseys. I can't remember, maybe it was Tipperary. I'd like to think it was mm -hmm. Offaly, from Offaly that were in the finals. Okay. But all the local shops printed using the GAA registered logo and the GAA are very protective over their marks. So all the Gansies in the local shop, which had a trademark on them and um, that wasn't licensed by the GAA, they got a cease and desist and they were to order to destroy everything. But the guy in question knew somebody who worked at an orphanage, probably somewhere in Eastern Europe, and said, well, listen, instead of destroying them, if I can give them to a charity and give you a receipt for that. And that was acceptable. So Interesting. There, there's a very famous case Tupac was a rapper and again there was a big infringement of people using his trademark um, on t-shirts and they were sent to Liberia to a charity and ended up being taken over by an army general at the time and he doled them out to all of his soldiers and they became known as the Tupac army. Uh, you can if you look the, if you look it up so yes. so that you know was Tupac was trying to do something good by not having them destroyed and send them to a charity but then I'd say he very much became a tarnished trademark mm -hmm. because of the use that his t-shirts were being put to so but but destruction is it's a big issue and 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 obviously no judge would likely ask an artist to destroy a piece of art or a series of works mm -hmm. which which I think is one of the cases we're going to talk about in relation to 
I don't know if you want me to go on transformative works. Um, you do, in, yeah, no, please, they, you're on a roll. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so if you, if, if, if you want to Google and, and have a, an overview of the whole concept in the USA on transformative works, I think one of the main people to look at is Richard Prince, who's an artist in the USA. And there was a very famous case of his uh, where he had taken a series of photographs by a French photographer, Carou, of Rastafarians. And he had produced an entire series of work around the Rastafarian photographs, where he took the original photographs and he might have done blue circles around their eyes or a bit of a blob here and a bit of a blob there. And he was sued by Carou and the original case was successful. Um, and the order was to destroy all of the artworks that had not been sold, to destroy all of the catalogues, and any of the artworks that had been sold could not be uh, exhibited in public. They had to be kept privately. And that was due to the fact the transaction had already taken place and the whole, you know, buyer beware and they received the good title. But then if they couldn't show it or resell it, what value did they have? And you were talking about a series of maybe 20 artworks, some of them selling for 10 million. So it wasn't mm. a, a judgment that would be taken lightly. And I think a lot of eyes were on it because it wasn't an individual work of art. It was an entire series of art. So anyway, he appealed and he was successful and it was deemed to be a transformative work. Um, well, some of it was and some of it was sent back to the judge. So again, they had to look at each piece of art on its own merits. Um, and the big question there was, he never gave a nod to the original art so he was never he never said well I was inspired by photographs or yes. you know he was asked mm -hmm. you know why the why did you use these and he was like well I just used them and this is what I did you know mm -hmm. whereas Jeff Coons who had previously been um, done similar in you know appropriating work had said well it was a nod to the artist and it gave me inspiration and I took it and I moved with it and I turned it into a new piece of art so in the in the Prince case the judge said, you know, it's it's not the artist's idea of what he's doing. So the fact that he didn't, you know, give an art to the original artist is not what we're looking at in the case. It's about the public perception and it's about copyright being able to enrich the public by using works of art, adding to them, changing them and creating a new work of art, which can only be good for society. So that's really in America, the kind of the bar that you, it's, it's a low enough bar now for transformative work. Mm. But like Richard Prince seems to just consistently do things like this, screen grabs, Instagram and, and puts a tag on it and says, no, 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 that's my transformative work. So that's why he's a really interesting character. I think he's actually making his name out of doing a lot of this at the moment. Well, probably, yeah. He's, yeah, he's quite contentious, but it, it's an interesting concept to look at. And um, yes. whereas in the EU, we are a lot more protective of art um, and of copyright and, you know, of the author's rights. And we, I'd say France is even, if the French photographer had taken this case in France, he wouldn't have won. Yeah. You know, because France mm -hmm. really, I mean, France protects artists' rights and architects and everything to such an extent that one architect successfully sued a hospital because they changed the windows. And he didn't like what they did, and it was tarnishing to him. Sorry, could you repeat work. that? You I know, mean, and there's all, they yeah. changed windows in a, a building. I think it was a hospital or something, and he didn't like it, so he sued them for infringement of his original architectural drawings. Like the French, if they don't like what you're doing to their work, they will sue you, and their rights are, are upheld, like really, really well in France, I must say, and and Europe as well. I think so. We don't allow there is fair dealing, and um, there is. Only since 2019 in Ireland was parody, caricature and pastiche um, uh, uh, basically a defence to copyright infringement. So, you know, I think artists are very much protected here. But then again, you do need to look at transformation, transformation using, you mm -hmm. know, original um, artworks and, and how you use them. But and you wouldn't get away as likely here as you would in the States on that. OK. On along similar lines, um, Pamela Debris writes, uh, who has the copyright if you take a photograph in or from a public place, say of reflections in the glass of a building, does the company who owned the building have any rights? Did I make that clear? Is it, you know, in other words, if you're, if yeah. you're around walking yeah, on the streets and you take a photograph so of Google's new building or something like that. Yeah. 
So this, this is another interesting one, actually. And um, we did have a case in the office not too long ago where um, somebody took a photograph from, um, oh, Getty Images, I think it was, and they used it on a product. Um, and it was of a historic building in Europe that was owned by somebody who saw the photograph and said, that's my building. Uh, you've no right to use my photograph. And it ended up that they had gotten a license to use it. They had done it the right way through Getty Images, who are very active in protecting their images. And we looked at the whole concept of um, the permission to use somebody else's building. Um, and again, it's different in different territories. And again, in France, it will be a lot more protected um, and in other areas in Europe. So the, the basic premise is, and just on that one, by the way, um, Getty Images or a lot of these stock images uh, have, they will need a property release from a property owner. And when we actually wrote them and asked us, asked them to give us a copy of the license that they had from the photographer who wasn't named, mm -hmm. we want to see your license, we want to see your property release. And uh, they came back because they had been saying, no, there's nothing wrong here. And then we said, well, give us a copy of your authority to do this. And then they immediately took the image down. And that was the end of it. Really? So, yeah. 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 So they obviously didn't. So it's always good to ask on what basis are you disseminating this artwork and licensing it? Because yeah. one thing, I suppose, one nugget is copyright does not pass unless it's in writing. So it has to be specifically transferred, assigned or licensed in mm -hmm. writing. If it's mm -hmm. not in writing, it's not valid. So, so that kind of, you know, looks at the property end. And I did a bit of research around it then in Ireland, because generally, if you take a picture of anything, a building from a public area, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. If you actually have to go into the building or into the property of somebody else, that's trespass. You can't yes. do it. Yes. If you, let's say, in gardens, in an estate or something, and you go in and you want to take photographs, well, then you have to have a right to be there. And sometimes people would put conditions on those rights, as in, you, you know, you can take photographs for your personal use, but you can't use them for commercial gain or for any commercial purposes. So then that's clear what you're taking the photographs for. Mm -hmm. But if you take a photograph of, let's say, your house and from the street, I mean, I have my mother has this a lot. She has a lives on an old Georgian mall in the country. And she's always on the calendar. She loves it. She loves getting the local calendar yeah. photographers every year with her front door on it. And, you know, yeah. she's on. And she has no rights because they have taken it. And the one thing I discovered in this case was that I didn't know was that um, the IFSC, if you want to take photographs in the IFSC, you need their consent to use them publicly. Yes. Yes. So that's an interesting one. Um, and yes, But yeah. generally, as long as you're not trespassing, yeah. you mm. can yeah, no, it's interesting because, you know, year, years ago, if you went into um, an art gallery or museum, um, you know, you, you, there's, there were things saying do not photograph all over the place. I think they've given up now because so many people go around with their cameras, their phones and take every single work, a photograph of everything. Yeah, which, uh, which I must say surprises me no end because there's no way unless you're a professional photographer. My view is my photograph is never going to be as good as what I could buy potentially in the gift shop on the way out. Yeah. You know, so you know, I I don't get people going in and just snap, 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 as opposed to look. And if you really liked something, buy your postcard or your your print on the way out of the gallery. I know. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't make sense. But obviously it's 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 become so endemic that they can't enforce um, you know, no photographs. Like no, they, they, they can't. And it's a pity, actually, because mm, I do think it, it ruins the, the whole ambience in a gallery. Mm. People, it's like going to a gig and the person sitting in front of you has their phone up recording for the entire performance. I mean, personally, you know, you shouldn't be experiencing a musical performance through a small lens. Yeah. Um, but, you know, each to their own. It's, gen it's generally rubbish recording like that on your phone. Oh, yeah. And are they ever going to look at it again? Yeah, no, no. Yeah. OK, um, if someone allows you to take a photograph of them for a project, possibly to be exhibited, what is the situation? If they give you permission, it's OK. But what if you want to use the photo in social media? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is 
This is a thorny question as well. Um, mm. and, and I suppose there's legal, but there's also, there's moral and there's courtesy, you know. Yes, it's, courtesy. Um, so there's yeah. no real, you don't really have a not the right to your image here, right? I don't have image rights in, to Eileen O'Gorman. Okay, and most of the case law um, that has gone before in this general jurisdiction, a lot of it in the UK is in relation to celebrities. So let's say you're using a celebrity's image um, in association with something that you're doing. Well, they actually do have goodwill in their image and they can potentially sue you, not for image rights, but for that goodwill we spoke about before in their brand, that you are trading on their brand, or maybe you're using their image to endorse a product which they don't necessarily endorse. Um, and, and that's where, you know, there are clear rights. But like you and I, well, maybe some of the people here would have image rights, but I definitely wouldn't hold out any hope that I could sue somebody and say, you can't use my image. I'm, do you know who I am? Because they'll say no, and neither does anybody else. So, yeah. you know, tough. Um, so, so, so to, sorry, I was to go out, say, as a photographer and just for practice, you wanted to take photographs of people because that was your particular yeah so so what we do have in ireland uh, is we have a constitutional right to privacy right so it's a non-enumerated okay. right and it's under the, the the constitution and you have a reasonable expectation of privacy so you know when you're doing something maybe private in a public sphere you have an expectation of private privacy where you're doing something very public in a public area like walking down Grafton Street and the sun hits your hair and a photographer grasps it well then you potentially don't have any right to privacy on that because you're not doing anything private and you know you're walking down Grafton Street mm. so there's a reasonable expectation you may be photographed if you go to say a public demonstration and your photograph is taken you have an expectation that that photograph may be published. So I don't think you could bring home a, a reasonable expectation of privacy mm. there. And um, it's it's basically a balance between privacy and then freedom of expression, which is also in the Constitution. So a photographer will say, well, it's freedom of expression. I took these photographs on a sunny day in Stevens Green or, and that the judge would have to look at all the facts and yes. decide who got the, you know, where the balance lay in relation to those rights, because mm -hmm. neither yeah. of them can necessarily trump the other. Um, and I think, you know, there hasn't been a lot of case law here about it, but let's say you photograph somebody in, in a, doing something that was maybe in a demeaning way. Well, then I think they could actually, mm -hmm. you know, potentially go after yeah. you and say, I had a reasonable expectation of privacy. But, you know, some people could say, well, then was it, defamatory and um, because they were doing something it's not defamatory because they were actually doing it right so you know it, it it actually happened but you could go after somebody for that reasonable expectation of privacy and the way that they portrayed you mm. and 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 it's it's a it's a tricky area i mean you then also have i think somebody did put something up on children you know uh, there like that's right yes if, if you yeah. can if you are going to do an exhibition and let's say you want to do something on you know miss it, the traveling community there are a lot of fabulous photographers who have worked in that community well then yes you would be better off if you're dealing with a subject and you're in among a community you know to say i'm doing it for this purpose and, and get a consent from them and then there's no issue and um, mm. but like if it's public and public people wandering around about their business um, and it's all very public well then you do have that depending on whether they'll take it and have an expectation of privacy on it and um, so it is it's not it's not a black and white area no. to look at and um, and and I think with children I would always be very careful I suppose how you would photograph you know so I, I actually had looked at that and I had you know a couple of questions so is 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 it in a private or a public space if it's a private space then obviously you should be getting a consent and um, you know is it sensitive what you're actually revealing because we now have gdpr as well right so yeah. you have to be careful about um gdpr and whether you're breaching a privacy right in relation to you know somebody's personal data and um, mm -hmm. Are they doing something public or are they doing something private in public? You know, so are they actually, as I said, if you're demonstrating, well, then you really 
you can expect that your photograph might end up somewhere when you go to a demonstration. Um, and then mm. you, is there a public interest as well? You know, and then what are you using it for? Are you using it for a political campaign? Well, then you're well, exactly. it, you know, mm. of maybe, you know, saying that this person endorses something where they may not have. So you really, again, have to look at a myriad of facts around something like that. Um, before you so do. Yvonne's point about an age limit is is that is that relevant? Uh, you know, I'm not sure actually. That's a good question. I haven't come across mm -hmm. it before. I think most people, yeah. if they were taking children, they probably would look for some form of consent. Well, definitely, if if your you know if your children are taking part in let's say a show or their local drama group or anything like that, they would generally send a consent form out to the parent, or else they would advise them that it's been recorded and there may be photographs taken, you know, and yeah. it's very difficult to say, well, I don't want my child in the photograph uh, because then don't put them on stage, you know, so, so there is, exactly. there's a fine line. I, I think definitely, yes, you know, you will always be asked for to tick the box on consent if you, you know, that there's no issue yeah. with photographs being taken. Sure. Now, pa Pamela says, you know, she doesn't like the idea of interfering with the spontaneity of an counter but really at the end of the day you should get um, a, a release form well, signed you know by what? somebody if you're going to profit from their image it, no it depends i mean there are all those famous photographs over the ages so you know a couple embracing on d-day or you know all these things where i'm sure it yeah. was spontaneous and the photograph photographer didn't get um, a consent it's also how identifiable are the people i mean there is I didn't have time actually to look at the stuff. And again, it's American law. There was a very, um, I remember an exhibition in New York where a photographer traveled on the High Line in New York and, and took photographs, this couple through their window um, on an ongoing basis. And some of them I would have thought were quite private. Um, but again, in the States, you know, the protection is so strong um, in relation to that. Um, and I think somebody's used the word again, incidental there in a question. Mm. So, yeah, incidental inclusion, I think, is fine. And, um, you know, and you do see all the photographs of back to Irish history of the young punks on Grafton Street. You know, they shouldn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy if they're exhibiting themselves yes, I suppose, exactly. in a public place, in a public fashion. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, but again, you know, no, I, I would err on the, uh, when you're dealing with somebody's public image, and in particular with children, I would always err on the side of caution if mm. it was available to you. Yeah, okay. Um, Pamela asks a question, who owns the artist well interviews? Would we as interviewees need permission to show them on our, on our website? See, the thing is, again, this context, you know, I'd love if you put it up there nearly so where no, that's that's mine you can't use it. so it, it really it's, it's in the eyes of the bat. yeah and actually you just made an interesting point there alan because you know people can get very protective over what they create but you're not creating it to hold it in mind and you're creating it to circulate it and to exploit it and disseminate it. you know so you, you have to draw a line between letting it loose out there you know, for the reason it was intended for yeah. being overprotected. So a bit like you with the work, you would be probably deemed to be the producer and director of, of this and um, these interviews and productions. So you would be the copyright owner. So the copyright owner is generally the creator. And everybody's probably aware of this. It's it's the artist, it's the composer, and um, it's the photographer themselves. And um, apart from if you're creating in, in the course of employment and you're an employee. So if you are a photographer who is employed by somebody and you are taking those photographs in the course of your employment, well then your employer owns the copyright on those images. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, okay, and, um, and I there's suppose, one from yeah, that, that's USA, actually, sorry. sorry, that's no, the commission, commission works as well. So if you are being commissioned to produce something, Oh, yeah. Your commission document should be very clear on who owns the copyright. Oh, that's very interesting. Mm. So you would own the copyright. Oh, so if there, if there isn't anything, Eileen. The artist owns it. Sorry. If, again, it needs to be yeah. in writing. 
Oh, okay. That's interesting. I wouldn't be aware of that. And actually, I, I would have thought it was like any other work of art. No. So, so you there was an interesting case again. I think it was in the states. They they obviously have a lot more case law than we do, where there was a large sculpture commissioned for a bank, some bank, and um, the sculpture the bank was doing a refit, and they wanted the sculpture removed, and the sculpture had actually been put together in the atrium of the building, so they couldn't take it in one piece and get it out. So they just took a hacksaw to to try and chop it down to get it out. Yes. And the artist sued, um, and rightly so, I would think. Mm -hmm. And the, ju the judge said it was a bit like Attila the Hun going in to destroy this artwork. Um, and I can't remember, I don't think the artist was successful in the States, but here they would be because you have your moral rights. Okay. And that's something we haven't touched, touched on yet. So, you know, you have your, your, I suppose, primary rights like copyright, trademark design. But you also have a, a moral right, which is the right of integrity and the right of paternity. So if somebody, say, for instance, took your artwork and used it somewhere, they, they would have to acknowledge you as the author of that work at all times. Yeah. Um, and the other thing on paternity and integrity, so that's paternity. The integrity right is that they can't mess with or defile your artwork. They can't change it um, without your consent. Mm. And they're important rights, I think, for people to remember as well uh, when you're dealing with different uses of artwork yeah. is, is that, you know, right of acknowledgement um, and right of integrity in an artwork. Yes, yes, yeah. That's really interesting, really interesting. There's one question from Susan Rossman in the States. Um, she's saying, I'm in the USA and have a question about taking and using images from magazines and books. I do collage art. It's kind of along the same theme as, as Paul. Um, but but again, you know, they're, they're probably taking something like, you know, the equivalent of the Sunday Times uh, style magazine, cutting out models and all this sort of stuff. D d is it, who, who, well, obviously the, the magazine is the right to it, but does it transfer to the artist because they're sticking it on something and adding or is it much the same as we've already talked about? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I don't practice law in the States, so I wouldn't be very clear on it. But just from, you know, an interest point of view, you've taken a transformative artwork. And I know, or I think Jeff Coons actually used somebody's photograph out of my name before, and he was successful in relation to it being deemed a transformative work of art. So if you're doing something sufficiently different to make it into a new piece of art, mm. you know, it, it would probably fall underneath the category of, of transformative art. I mean, here, as I said, in Ireland, only in the 2019, like our Copyright Act is the 2000 Act, Copyright and Related Rights Act. And that was a really amazing piece of legislation here. It really modernized, you know, the whole area of intellectual property in Ireland. And, um, you know, and it did deal with digital markets. And then the next serious revision was 2019, where, they brought in, if you have copyright in your work, you can consent to other people copying it or using it, right? So okay. basically they can copy it or make it available to the public without your prior consent, mm. which must be in writing. And um, there's some exceptions to that rule. And one of the exceptions is if it's been used for criticism or review. Mm -hmm. um, and the other exception that came in only in 2019 was parody, caricature or pastiche. And that was always um, an exception to infringement in different territories. So, you know, it brought Ireland forward in relation to that. So you'd wonder then if that kind of collage or if there's an element of parody. And again, it's each work has looked on its own merits. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. Frank Rafter of the Leinster Printmaking Studio says, I was given a photo reference um, at a portrait drawing class and would like to share my drawing on social media. I don't know if there's a copyright in the photo reference. Uh, or who is it's attributable to. So is it best not to show my work in case it infringes copyright law? I mean, this is interesting because I do this a lot as well. I would get a photograph, mm. but it's not for public consumption. It's for teaching purposes. Yeah, so for teaching purposes, uh, you know, there are certain excep exceptions to copyright infringement. Mm. Um, and also, I, I'm not sure what's being done with the photo or if it's no photo or presumably somebody owns it um, if you don't but know. See, he, doesn't, he doesn't know because he, he never yeah. asked the question. Yeah, I mean, I, 
you know, it's like anything. You can't say, yeah, fire ahead because you're always using somebody's work and copying it mm. is infringement. But then to what extent is somebody going to go after you? Um, sometimes there is a whole area called orphan works. Okay. So orphan works are where somebody doesn't know, you know, the anonymous writer of poetry, you know, or oh, somebody yes. doesn't know who produced a piece of work. Yes. And if you can show that you have taken steps to identify the author and get consent, mm. well, that can be a good defense if somebody comes back, you know, yeah. to bite you. And this was something um, that came up a good few years ago when a lot of the galleries decided to digitalize their collection. Yes. Um, and, you, you know, for, a, for an art for a piece of work that is still within copyright so you probably all know that copyright is 70 years after the life of the author so a copyright still subsists in a work for 70 years after the author died mm -hmm. and if there are co-authors let's say i always think beatles i mean if paul mccartney did actually own whoever owns their publishing now i think i've lost track mm -hmm. but the fact that paul mccartney is still alive so that any of the lennon mccartney work will only the clock will start ticking after he dies and he'll have another 70 years you know okay. it's it's, yeah. it's it's there for quite a long period so you know making a digital um copy of a work is a copy and you need the artist's consent if it's in copyright yes. still so in in this particular case with frank if he if he merely said um uh my, my drawing is based on a photograph uh who, um author of which unknown so if the yeah, author would turn around and say, actually, author. that was me, well, then they can say, fine, well, thanks very much. I was going to yeah. find out, I was trying to find out who you were to give you some attribution, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you'd be safe enough. Probably would, yeah. I mean. Okay. Now, Robert Kelly, does applying metadata to photo images of the artworks asserting copyright help to protect the artist maker in the event of a legal dispute over usage of the images in any way? Now, I, I, I'm not really up on metadata, but I, I know you can put a copyright notice in an image, embedded you know, in an image. I am, I am not 100% sure, but I am nearly sure that one of the other changes in the 2019 legislation was that the metadata itself has protection. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if you can prove copyright from your metadata, well, then, yes, absolutely. It's, it's if you can put it in there. And then... I suppose that lead, leads us all into the area of NFTs. Precisely. You know? <laughs> Back to page so, one. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah. I am no technical, right? Um, mm, and okay. I, I went through, I'm involved in an international organization called the International Bar Association. So we have great fun that we get to travel to amazing places and meet people who will talk copyright and trademark infringement so cows come home. Mm. And there, I was at a meeting in Berlin in November and we were brought to the Koenig Gallery by the owner of the gallery who had an NFT platform set up and an NFT gallery in Berlin. I mean, the gallery itself, if you ever get to go there, is beautiful. It's in a, a brutalist church. It was a fabulous experience. And he showed us an NFT that they had minted of an exploding Lamborghini. Um, and we, we spoke a lot about NFTs in the evening and there was also one of the more traditional gallery owners and they're saying, well, we're embracing NFT technology and you will buy your NFT and we'll put it in a lovely box with a certificate and give it to you. And he was like, you're missing the point here. The whole thing about an NFT is that it doesn't need a physical um, embodiment of it to be something that's tradable. And, you know, People have different views, whether they're into NFTs or they're not. And the people were trying it and saying, mm, you know, I'd still prefer to have the touch and the feel of, you know, the piece of art on my, my wall. And, you know, we spoke about how an NFT could be really good for, for tracing provenance, because a lot of these art lawyers, and particularly in America, where they're looking at, you know, reclaiming or re patriating Holocaust art and things like that. They're looking at the provenance and artworks are being discovered where, you know, is that really a Picasso or is it not? And how do you prove provenance of an artwork? And NFTs, where you have a, a, a blockchain in technology that can't be tampered with, mm. um, was deemed to be a really good way to, to have that kind of certificate of authenticity behind it. And then it was used as something, and obviously this guy was a 
Beebles that sold his collection for 69 million threw it totally onto the market. And then initially you could only buy it through Bitcoin. And then, you know, now you can actually trade it all the time. And every single trade on an NFT is tracked in your blockchain, right? Yes. So one good thing about it for an artist is they will get a payment on every trade of that. Now, I know you have your resale rights here, but, you know, they're subject to various exceptions and limitations. Um, but on an NFT, if you can trade on a digital marketplace, you know, every ongoing trade is there. You know exactly where your work is going and you're getting compensation along the line. It's easier to track a lot of things. Um, but I suppose the bottom line to me on NFTs is the basic principles of copyright law still apply. So, you know, you can mint your artwork um, and you can sell it as an NFT. Um, people sometimes sell bits, so they fractionalize the artwork and they will NFT portions of it. I actually thought when I was chatting to people in Berlin that it would be a really good way for starting off artists, like a kind of a crowdfunding, that you get a piece of my work, you know, and that crowdfunds and gives me money to maybe produce more work. And um, so I think it's you have to embrace technology and use it and think of novel ways that it benefits, I would think, the artist. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it just seems to be a, a, a lot of a trading platform at the moment. You know, yes, there's a lot of yeah. people speculate. Um, they win, they lose, and I know. It's, yeah, it, it's interesting as long as the money can go back to the artist at the end of the day. Sure. Mm. Um, on, on that subject, um, I am interviewing a, an independent journalist from the states during the week, and I'm recording it because she's in the east west coast of, of America, um, and she's a specialist. I heard her interviewed, and I was so blown away by it uh, with her knowledge of that whole area, and she's a very balanced view and everything. You know, she's she sees the good and the bad in the thing. Um, I'm going to be interviewing her and at some point we'll, we'll share that with people. Right. And that will be really interesting. You know? Yeah, I think so. so I, I think, think it's going to ask, answer a lot of the questions, um, say, from Derek Cully and, and others on that. And Kira, um, maybe I should just look at Kira's for a second because hers is a little longer. I just thought of a talk of copyright you mentioned. Invited, she's been invited to show and sell some paintings on an F NFT platform. Um, I had the process explained to me, but I'm still not fully clear how it works. OK, that really is something for that interview, isn't it? Rather than asking you. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. They, it's, it's basically it's all about the minting, how, how your work is taken and created into an NFT yeah. and then what the terms and conditions on the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the reality is even they can be copied. Yes. And, 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 and copying them is an infringement of your copyright. Yeah. So. Exactly. Like, you know, it's, it's, we obviously have a new directive transposed into law in Ireland, which is the copyright um, yeah. in the digital single market. And while it's trying to balance what it's, a lot of it is based on, you know, user generated content or sharing of links. So it's based on platforms that make their money out of other people's work. So they are literally a conduit. And in the past, they would not be held up for infringement if, let's say, I made a video um, and used somebody's music and I put it up and, and basically they said, well, you know, right, to use our music. It's user generated. So they'd have to sue me, not the platform. The platform exactly. felt they were hosting. It yeah. only, whereas this is putting, the platform is the one making the money, though. So this mm. is putting the onus back on those platforms to actually, uh, you know, remunerate the creators because the artists were really the ones losing out here while, you know, the YouTubes of this world and everything were making a fortune. That's right. Um, right so right. it'll be interesting that they're moving. But I mean, the one thing when all these digital, um, you know, kind of That's potential it's... comes in is yeah. it always goes back to the basic. Is your piece of work original? Did you create it? Well, then you have the copyrights in it and you can stop anybody else from disseminating it to the public or from copying it without yeah. your consent. OK, all right. Now, I want to bring people, allow people to ask you questions in person, but I'm just going to read what's here first. Um, Pamela Debris says, how can you find out if a trademark is registered and what rights are attached to it? Remember, you were referring to that. Yeah, so you, you literally one. go in. I mean, this the beauty of the Internet. I don't know where we'd be today without it. So there is, if you're looking in Ireland, 
if you go into the Irish Intellectual Property Office, I think it's the IPOI, the Intellectual Property Office of Ireland, they have a whole search facility and you put in the words um, that you want to check and you will see if there's a trademark. Uh, there's also TM View, which is through the European um, Copyright or the European Intellectual Property Office and they do worldwide searches. They will search oh, every yeah. trademark register in the world. Yeah. Um, also, can I just say that, mm. you know, you may not have come across WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, WIPO's website is an absolute amazing um, source of information. For How students. do you spell that, Eileen? W-I-P-O. Okay. So it just, they have a fantastic source of information on all intellectual property rights. Mm -hmm. um, and they also, you know, they have various uh, mediation for disputes, you know, dispute mm -hmm. resolution, and they look at trade in the IP, they look at, um, you know, protecting rights on consistently reviewing and trying to work in that space. But it's, it's a website that, you know, if you have any interest in this area, and um, they have fantastic things. You can do courses there. You can, they're really, really, really good. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Very good. But trademark searching is quite easy. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought so. Mm. Um, Claire Halpin asks, does the fact that it is painted change that? I presume she means that, you know, if you have a photograph, but you're actually painting it. So you're putting a painterly touch to it, which is your own style and your own, you know, art, yeah. if you like. Does that change something? Probably yeah. not if there's a big likeness. If they see again, are you copying somebody's work? Mm. You know, well, it, you're copying it, a photographer's work, probably. Yeah, you are, yeah. and yeah. and it's it, it is. It depends on on what you're doing. I mean, you see it. There was uh, the street art stuff around the um, the referendum for gay marriage. I mean, there was the beautiful mural of the couple um, yes. embracing, and that was originally a photograph, and um, that the artist then used the photograph to create the work. But hmm. they may, had an agreement to do that, All right. you know, yeah. and that was originally inspired, I think, by the meeting on the turret stairs. So, That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're looking at it's fascinating, really, if you're looking at people work that's taken on and on. So if it is hmm. yeah, it, an artist like let put yourself, I would always say put yourself in the artist's shoes. You are an artist. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would yeah. you feel about it? Exactly. Yeah, that that uh, that embraces everything. Um, Rupert Warren from Germany says, as a photographer, I'm required to provide property releases. So if I say I own X, it's mine. So it's, a, it's OK, question mark. But if I buy a Coca-Cola bottle, am I still allowed to photograph the bottle as advertising my photographic abilities to photograph such objects? Yeah, I, I wouldn't see a big issue with that. No. I mean, you're, yes, you it's an example rather than he's trademark. trying to sell the bottle. Yeah, you're not you're not yeah. selling a Coca-Cola under their trademark. No, no. OK. Catherine Gagan asks, what's the situation with proper maintenance of an artwork? If bad maintenance alters the integrity of the artwork, could this be grounds for suing the owner? It's a bit like your sculpture in the, the office block. Yeah, I mean, they're your moral rights. Yeah. Basically, at the end of the day, to protect the integrity of the work of art. OK. Um, All and right. I suppose it's where is it, you know, is mm. being how accessible is it? I mean, definitely if, if it was a gallery or a commission piece they weren't minding it mm. you probably would have rights you know yeah okay cabrini uh, says um recopyright in, in sculpture can you take a copy of a head for example if the sculpture is over 70s or over 70 years dead uh, or do you have to have permission from the estate of the artist or the gallery uh where he she works are so if if we're talking about copyright so copyright just lasts for the life plus mm. seven years so once yeah. it's expired it's expired that, that's it regardless of who owns it yeah because there's no copyright in it anymore yeah. okay um eilish says i've created video pieces which comprise elements of historical photographic images for example to capture the ambience of an era generally no information regarding the original creator of the image is available have you any thoughts on this yeah, so I mean, I suppose if they're historical, how old are they again? And is there still a copyright in there? And then are they all orphan works? So have you taken, there's actually a whole section, I think, on orphan works on the WIPO website. Mm -hmm. You know, the steps you should take to look for the creator of the work if you're using them. Yeah. And um, there's a whole kind of cultural appropriation end of things as well. Certain things protect it. 
uh, heritage wise you know you can't use the Irish harp and um, they were actually trying to change the law I think for the national anthem recently because it was running out of copyright really uh, yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, traditional cultural works, it's, you know, the old reels, can they be used in music and create new works? And, you know, a lot of the times they can and they've been passed through. So, yes. yeah, it depends again on the images and, and if there's anything there to say who the owner is or even if there's still copyright subsisting in it. Yeah. Are you there, Tim? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Would you yeah. like to ask a question there? Oh, hello, Eileen. Thank you very hello, much Tim. for what I've heard so far. Sorry, um, Tim, can, can you put on your, your, your image, your video? Um, or can you? Yes, I think I can. Yeah, it's just, it's just looks better, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, here I am. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, Eileen, I, I, I have a specific question because I, I have a show on at the moment and a company has approached me and they want to buy a large piece of work and they want to transform it into an NFT. Now, I'm very sketchy on NFTs, but he gave me about 15 minutes of talk about what it was. And my head nearly fell out the door. I was so confused. But, but anyway, as far as I can gather, he will turn it into a code, but he also buys the physical work. And as far as I can gather, it will be stored in somewhere like Geneva Freeport, which they say is the biggest museum of un unseen work ever, it's full of Picasso's and things. But anyway, my specific question is, I just want to, I'm keen to go ahead, obviously, because I want to sell the piece of work. And he said, as you were saying, that every time there's a transaction, there will be um, a royalty to the artist if it is sold again. But um, I, I'm just wondering how safe it is to sell it as an NFT, thinking that the, the actual physical piece of work might never be seen again and locked away in a big warehouse in Geneva. Yeah, and, and I mean, there is, as you say, there are warehouses of artwork that will never be seen that are used. People buy them for currency, for leverage. They yeah. bank them, they insure them, they use them to borrow. Um, and, and, you know, that's a shame. But again, it's a commodity based thing. Yes. Um, so for you, are you happy for your original artwork to be warehoused? Um, that's something I suppose it's a moral question on the NFT. I suppose this is the way they're going to make money and they feel they'll make more money by the resale and you will get a royalty. So it's more like it's a different set of rights, really, that are being exploited. Um, yes. And it's it's to show how they do it. Again, the technology, I'm, you know, I only have a very much overview of it. Um, and yeah. but I suppose you'll really need to see. They will need your consent to make the NFT. That's the main thing. So even if they buy your work of art and they don't get consent to make an NFT, yeah. they, they can't make an NFT without your consent because they're copying no, your art no. and making it available to the public. That's why at least they're upfront on it. Um, and then I suppose, you know, will you create an ongoing income stream from the trading of that work of art? Yes, I see. I see. But no, maybe I'm right saying that in Ireland, we own our copyright, our sources. We, we sell a painting, but we don't sell the copyright. No, no. But, um, and that's... but is it not true that there is a law in Ireland that anything that sells over 3,000 euro, the 3% goes to the artist's royalty? That's the artist resale, right? Um, yeah. So you are correct in the copyright. So if you sell a work, you're selling the physical work, but unless you yeah. specifically transfer the copyright in that work in writing, and um, you're not selling the copyright. So, so I still own the copyright, even if it's an NFT. You well, it, that see, that's where I you'd have to look at the paperwork that they give you. You'd yes. be contracting out of the copyright. Now, will you be licensing them the copyright for specific use, or will you be yeah. assigning it in full? That's what you need to probably look at. Yes. I see. Um, but yes, you do. You 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 know the artists here do retain their copyright. And sorry, there was something else you said there that I've lost my. Yeah, well, the resale thing because as far as I can gather, the resale royalty isn't actually happening in practice. Yeah, so the resale royalty is basically you're right. There is threshold, and I think it is three thousand, um, yeah. and also needs to be sold in a kind of a an auction house. Um, yeah. And then there's the whole thing about who pays it. Does the person selling or does the person buying? Or is it yeah. 
you know, is it on both? So I think as far as I know in Ireland, it's the person selling because that makes sense because they're getting the money and they have to yeah. pay the percentage to the gallery and then the gallery has to pay that on to the artist. And yeah. is there, there's a visual art, is it IVA, the visual arts? There is. Are they acting as a collection society for a resale right? Collection, I'm not sure about. There's certainly a sort of a body that look, looks over that, but I I'm see. not sure if they physically collect it. Yeah, yeah, so like if you're an artist with a gallery, obviously it's a lot easier to monitor that because the gallery will have, but there is an obligation on the gallery to pay that. I see. Um, yeah, um, so it's, it's definitely one to look out for. Yeah. So to be the, uh, if it's going through auction, the auction house would be obliged mm. to give that, would they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I see. Whereas if it's okay. a private sale, you probably wouldn't know about it even. No, yeah, you wouldn't. I, I don't think it applies <clears throat> on private sales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really is at, at a certain level. So in a way, the positive thing about an NFT is it does create a stream and a royalty for an artist. It's, yes, so it's yes. very much like music. So every time if you wrote, you know, a hit song, every time that's played on the radio, yes. it's played in film, it's played in the background of the hairdressers, a royalty is collected from a, a collecting society in Ireland. Yes. Um, and the writer of the lyrics, the original writer, gets a percentage and they get their public performance royalty rights paid to yes. on an ongoing basis. So in a way, this is giving something similar to the arts. It, the, the resale right was meant to do with number one. Maybe the NFTs will add another income stream for artists, which is yes, sure. interesting. Sure. As long as there is an agency monitoring and collecting it. Yes, I see. Yeah. I think. Well, here's another little question. There's, there's, there's um, <coughs> maybe a myth, but I believe that Bonnar sold a, a painting to the um, to the Louvre from Paris, and um, one of the uh, attendants saw an old man down the end of the gallery adding a little bit to a painting, rushed over, and it was Bonnard himself, 30 years later, adding to the painting. I wonder, is, is he allowed to add to his own painting in a public collection? <laughs> That's a strange yeah, one. There was, was an, an, I couldn't find the name, but I, I know a French lawyer um, based in Paris, and yeah. he had a case where a specific artist decided that he actually didn't like a selection of art he had done in the past. So yes, he would yeah. disclaim authorship. And, and the people who had paid a lot of money for his work were obviously not too happy about that. No. But he was saying, well, I am the author, so I have every right yes. not to be associated with this work that I don't want to be associated with anymore. Yes. So, I mean, really, they, these questions come in every shape and size, and, and it's interesting. It's what keeps us all on yeah. our toes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim, thanks very much for that. Um, just one final one. Yvonne Maloney says, what about quoting people's written word under an artwork? Sometimes it may be from a song or a famous person, sometimes not. Again, I would have thought attribution would sort that one out. I mean, it should, uh, it, it, the whole copying is a substantial part. Yeah. Right. So are you, co co you know, if, if it's obviously, you know, it depends if you're taking a piece of a poem, you know, mm. a, a substantial part of a poem um, would be a lot less than a substantial part of, of a book. Yes. Yes, you exactly. Know? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are loads of people who are too shy to ask you questions, but um, just so that everyone knows, uh, if you want to ask uh, any questions, Eileen is the person to ask when it comes to copyright, trademarks, any intellectual property, anything like that. So um, in the, the recorded version of this on YouTube, uh, I'll be putting down um, her contact details, right? Both the practice and her individual contact details. And using that, you'll be able to contact her and uh, talk about anything you need to, to, to do. Okay, Eileen, are you happy with that? Yeah, I mean, I see Geraldine Clark is a uh, behind camera, and um, she, she's and hiding. She is also a lady that okay. will absolutely answer your questions. Um, and I mean, maybe in I don't know six months or a year's time, Alan, if people yeah. think we can do a revisit on this, you know, be it might be interesting. That'll be wonderful because I know it's going to spark a lot of thought. That's for sure. Yeah, well, it um, sparks thoughts with us as well, and I think Geraldine yeah. will agree. I mean, 
you know, when it comes to this area, one of the interests is that it, it's always evolving and changing and the questions that come up are always novel, you know, yeah. and it's seldom that you will get two cases exactly the same or so cut and dry that you say, yeah, absolutely. There's always going to be. Yeah. Well, the, you know, and at the, at, the end, at the end of the day, isn't it all about being honest and human about the thing and saying, look, how would I feel if I was in that person's shoes? I and that solves so. a lot of legal argument. Yeah, it does. And, and you, you, you want to, invo- uh, uh, you know, you just want to avoid it. Unless, obviously, you know, look up Richard Prince. I think he actually goes looking for it sometimes. I mean, I'd love if he was our client. Yeah, well, he's, he's getting free <laughs> column interest, isn't he? Well, he does. Yeah, but yeah. I think that's part of what he does and um, his Probably. art. And yeah. Yeah, OK. So I think I mean, thank you so much. Too. Yeah, thanks so much for, for your time and for your expertise. We yes, really do appreciate you. it. I, I know I speak for mo- all, all of us here. Um, now, next week, um, we have a visual artist who was described um, by a, a well-known gallerist as being one of the, having had one of the strongest contemporary shows he's ever seen anywhere in the world uh, and would certainly be a significant um, marker in Ireland's art history. Um, that's a very interesting theory to, thing to hear from a gallerist. So um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. I'll let you know who it is. Um, on Wednesday, as usual, on my social media. And I look forward to seeing you next Saturday. But in the meantime, thanks again to Eileen. And thank you all for watching from wherever you are in the world. And uh, don't forget, if you like this, give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Take care.